welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Vinnie Eastwood Show. We're broadcasting live on AmericanFreedomRadio.com. He's back, back in black, ladies and gentlemen, like frickin' Akadaka. It's Vinnie Eastwood, ladies and gentlemen. We've been on, been on a holiday for about 10 days. And you know what was, was something very interesting about being on holiday from conspiracy theories and, and uh, people coming to talk to you about uh, helping them out and, and exposing scumbaggery and, do, and doing videos and all of that kind of stuff because you're pretty much the only person who does that sort of thing in this country? There's no such thing as a holiday. I, I was interrupted on average six times per day for, e- for uh, each of those days of my holiday by people needing me to do something for them. And the vast majority of which I did help, including uh, Ian R. Crane, who came over here from the UK to deliver four lectures. And those lectures are now published up on uh, my YouTube channel. You can click on the eugenics button, uh, the YouTube eugenics button on the vinnieeastwoodshow.com if you want to go see uh, the four 90-minute and 720 HD lectures of his that I had published and uploading within 24 hours of him delivering those speeches. There is also, um, what was his name, Uh, John Ansell, who is a uh, guy from, I think, the ACT Party or whatever, leading this uh, new party discovery called the uh, the Colorblind Party, attempting to uh, rid away with some of the uh, racial divides and, and what have you with New Zealand and uh, what he calls uh, Griva Māori and the, uh, the industry that has flocked abound around uh, treaty claims. Uploaded that. So even on my day off, uh, even on my week off, ladies and gentlemen, I still actually wind up producing more content than most people do when they're doing 40 hours a week of this kind of game. <laughs> All right? <laughs> Seriously. I, uh, <laughs> I was quite surprised at, at how much I did. So, today, we have a very special guest, uh, and his name is Will Burlinghoff. His website is rainbow-phoenix.com that's www.rainbow dash like a little uh, dash in the middle thingy there phoenix.com Will, welcome to the program he's joining us from Canada I believe No, actually Vinny I'm joining you from Australia a Canadian who's now living in Australia as it happens well that's funny because so. we had a conversation yesterday and there was sort of a bit of a, a confusion because you, you, you're married to an Australian and I thought you were living in Canada or, or Australia but, <laughs> but now we know yeah my wife wouldn't have appreciated my living in us in Canada and all that I think so I moved here about four months ago all oh, right. So, How have you been enjoying yeah. it? Is uh, Agenda 21 coughing up some nice sparkling uh, 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 chem- chemtrail uh, lovingness for you? Well, actually, I'm very fortunate to be living in a section of Australia, in Western Australia, actually, where we just aren't having a lot of chemtrails, I'm happy to say. So, no problem there. Yeah, I've heard that Western Australia is a kind of like in a, in a league of its own. Um, uh, the the city Perth, I think, is the most isolated city in the world, and it, it's got its own, it's got its own uh, uh, government in Western Australia and all of that kind of thing. It's vastly different from the rest of the country and indeed the rest of the world. Yeah, that's for sure. I was in Perth a few weeks ago, and I must admit they have no end of chemtrails and harp activity happening there. I've never seen any clouds like that in my life so it was quite amazing and then come back here to the small town of Denmark Western Australia it was just a total relief to come back to sanity again and the clear clear skies you, so it was great oh yeah well I, I, I suppose one time when you when you when you think about chemtrail activity I've, I've been um, receiving emails and messages from so many people that are living in uh, rural areas where you you wouldn't expect it and they see these giant ones come come right across every every now and again yeah quite honestly I think they just forgot about Denmark and de- deemed it as not significant enough here in uh, this part of Western Australia to even worry about chemtrails is it much of a food a un- is it much of a food growing area? Very rural. Yes, a lot of uh, organic farming happening here and uh, dairy cattle and things like that. So I don't mind that at all. 
Good, good diet. I've actually lost weight since I've come here. It's either that or my wife is starving me to death. One or the other. <laughs> you know, something my producer noticed when he moved to uh, New Zealand from the United States, all the uh, the different high qu- higher quality food that we've got here. Um, his entire family, like, uh, just just shed the pounds. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. In any video links that I I do back home to my family and friends in Canada, they all remark on how much weight I've lost, and uh, that's the truth of it. So I'm not not dissatisfied with that at all. Okay. Well, for those who are, who are unfamiliar, you you you're a um was a, a shaman, a, a practicing shaman. Can I ask you? What exactly is a practicing shaman in the Agenda 21st century? Well, that's a a very interesting question in itself. I did study shamanism through a group in the United States uh, called the Deer Tribe, and that allowed me to find that connection with Mother Earth or the Earth uh, Logos, Gaia. And I think that simply gives you an impression or an understanding of the significance of the consciousness of the planet itself. Now, I wouldn't describe myself entirely as a shamanic practitioner, but I do have my shamanic background, and uh, I would say that my real focus is more the spiritual uh, information that I have access through, through my channeling ability, but that has a lot to do with the shamanic approach, too, so that's how I see myself as a practicing shaman of a spiritual nature. So let me get this straight. You're sort of a, an information conduit plus channeling equals a uh, spiritual guide? Yeah, that would be a very good way of, of saying it. I do have a background in psychology from way back. Don't ask me how long ago I graduated. But after my graduation and, you know, um, emerging out of the web of uh, the manipulated consciousness, I started my own personal journey that many years ago, 30 plus years ago, and along the way I've just acquired the ability to be able to be this open conduit for a a living force of consciousness that calls itself cosmic awareness, and that is the area that I, I specialize in, but I have been Uh, able to do things like the tarot card readings and uh, counseling work, regression work, all of that is all part of the umbrella that I I sit under. Well, it says on your profile that you um, are good at getting people through trauma and and what have you. How, How exactly would you go about that? Well, my personal approach to that would be to help them get into the level of the trauma, that being through, if I'm doing a counseling session, uh, through taking them through regression therapy, taking them into a deeper level of their consciousness. I work at uh, what I call a multidimensional level, so my acceptance of the fact that we have a consciousness that far exceeds our physical awareness and understanding is uh, that which helps me the most in helping them get to a traumatic situation in their lives. And quite honestly, what I would help them do is re-script the trauma and release it from their consciousness, from their body, from from their lives. And that's how that part works. It's actually a little more detailed, but I think that's the thumbnail sketch. Well, trauma for me is actually one of the uh, most beneficial processes that your mind and body can go through um, in that it there's an old saying, it's uh, those whose reach exceeds their grasp are the only ones who find out how far they can truly reach. Um, mm. and, and I relay this to uh, trauma as well. Those who have suffered the most are the only ones who can find out how much they can truly survive. You know, you have a very, very valid point there. Because trauma, when it releases or when you have recognition, when you understand the lessons that are contained within a traumatic experience can be very liberating. But equally, it can be very damaging if you can't release that negative experience and the negative effects of that experience. That's why I think it is important to release the trauma so that you can actually access the lessons and uh, the experience that lie beyond it. It is a little bit, I'd say, like you know, going into a cauldron and being refined from the dross into the purity of gold or the purity of spirit or consciousness. 
if I may, it sounds um, similar to chiropractic where you've got all these um, pressures and traumas uh, in your life that actually have a physical effect on you. You get um, manifestations in your, in your spine and your, and your and discs slipping and, th- and things like that. Um, and really, Absolutely. really highly skilled chiropractors can figure out what that past trauma was in your life and then uh, give you an adjustment and it puts you and it puts you back right and lets it go. That, that's a good analogy right in itself. I like the uh, analogy of colonics, where many layers have been impacted in the intestinal tract. And, you know, as those layers impact there, the ability to absorb or to function well is greatly reduced. And colonics, of all things, would take those layers away. So I guess I perform a kind of colonic uh, practice there of removing the layers that impede one's uh, clarity and wisdom and knowledge and like a chiropractic procedure once you relieve that pain or those layers then you come to the essence then you come to the actual base of one's personality and you can function so much better as a result Mm. that's how I see it at least (laughs) well well, I I think of this um, we're, we're talking about essentially medical treatment Right or or well, not in the allopathic sense of the word, or the um, yeah. but but we're talking about deeper things, and and if you have Absolutely. a look at what causes illness, ninety uh, percent yeah. stress. Absolutely, stress and a buildup of that energy of the mind of the of the heart because it's often very emotionally related that it uh, layers up again, and we think that's normal. We assume that we have to live at such high levels of stress. In fact, we're taught you have to have stress because stress is what gets you through. Well, stress is a motivator. It helps indeed in helping people deal with situations. But I think there's another way, and this is part of my shamanic training, that taught you can have something called relaxed focus. In other words, you do not have to be on that edge of rawness all the time, you can actually deal with life in that relaxed way where the focus is so complete and thorough that you can sail through the situation without losing control. Because under stress, often we also lose control and are incapable of dealing with any given situation because of the stress. So it's one of those things I feel that there has to be a balancing here of how much stress is good and how much is detrimental and negative. I would say that the short-term stress, which is like, oh, I've got to get this done now, I've got to get this done now, and then you get it done, and then that's fine because that's a, that's a, <laughs> that's a time-sensitive uh, short window. It's the yeah. constant suffering, stressfulness, uh, nervousness, uh, living one day to the next that really pisses people off. And if you really look at our lives and how we've been shepherded into a type of lifestyle when, where long-term stress is debilitating and accumulative, you can see why illness begins to take its toll. Of course, on the other side of the coin, those who are in charge of the medical industry love that because it just gives them more business. So no problem there yeah. for them. <laughs> <laughs> Well, problem for us equals revenue source for them. That's that's how I've um, kind of become to understand okay. the uh, the medical industry, um, essentially, essentially because it wouldn't have a business if people weren't sick. Mm-hmm. And uh, I believe that it might be acutely aware of this. It may be at some level of the medical establishment that illness mm-hmm. equals profit. Um, and so mm-hmm. they purposely give people pills and vaccines and uh, other uh, radio radioactive therapies and, and, and what have you in order to make them sick so that they can keep treating them for the illnesses that they propagated in the first place. Absolutely. You've got that correct. And isn't it a wonderful scam that they've got going that they've convinced the audience, the masses, to believe that their particular form is that which gives them health and well-being when it's exactly the opposite for most cases. Now, don't get me wrong, I do know there are those times when we need to go to our doctors, need to go into our hospitals, need that treatment. 
but I am a firm believer that if you actually get to underlying causes, if you reduce the stress and the emotional impact of traumas and whatever else is needed, then you're going to start putting yourself on the road for wellness and uh, that is something they certainly do not want us to look into because if that was the case, as we're saying, they would be minus a revenue source. Then they extend that um, concept into the areas of control over the foods we eat, the sprays that are put on to them, availability of those practices that are quote alternative, so they're always under attack. But instead we get a plethora of, of techniques, of approaches, of medical practices that are actually all designed to keep us ill and not in a state of balance or well-being. So you can see, as many of your uh, listeners I'm sure already know, how insidious this whole... Well, you know what it sounds like? It sounds like they're trying to create order out of chaos. And that's exactly what they do all the time, man. Create a crisis, then when people react to the crisis, they come back and ask you for help, and you're only too willing to oblige. As long as they give up all their rights and sovereignty and give you all the power and money, we'll be right back at the Show.com. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Vinnie Eastwood Show. No Standing alone against scumbaggeroom. Oh, yeah. Synchronicity. Have you ever heard of this, uh, 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 ladies and gentlemen, how you just kind of think about something and then all of a sudden it happens? Um, I mentioned in the first segment how when uh, I was uh, off on holiday, I filmed some stuff for uh, Ian R. Crane when he was speaking here in New Zealand. And uh, during uh, on my way to the presentation, I was thinking about my mate Barry, who um, occasionally donates me some uh, petrol vouchers. Um, and who knows more about guns in, in, in New Zealand than anybody I've ever talked to in my life. Really, really knowledgeable dude. And uh, on my way to uh, this uh, series of lectures, I was thinking to myself, Barry, 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 why am I thinking about Barry? Mm. And then I pull up, there is one space left in the car park, and it is the closest possible space to the opening door and the ramp to get all my equipment inside. And who's walking towards my car just as I park up? Barry! to help me carry all my stuff inside. And then Ian uh, uh, Crane, uh, during his lecture, he um, talks about how this uh, phenomenon of thinking about somebody um, and you don't know why you're thinking about them and then suddenly they're there, they suddenly they show up to, t uh, to uh, see you or they give you a phone call or, or something of that nature. And me and Barry looked at each other and was like, yes! Uh, and, and, and it's a daily basis uh, thing for me, essentially. Uh, and I put it down to, I guess y you can only really rationalize the things that you don't fully understand and can scientifically explain. So I rationalize it like this. The reason why nothing like that ever happened to me before um, uh, getting into this field of work is because all I was doing was working for some soulless corporation, not doing something that I really wanted to do, not fulfilling my creative potential, not talking with people who I thought were really intelligent, who inspired me and, and encouraged me or whatever and, and, and made me better on in my life. I wasn't sitting right with the universe. Now I'm doing the direct opposite of all those things that I was doing. And I am sitting right with the universe. And the universe confirms this for me by doing things for me. My very special guest is Will Berlinghoff uh, from rainbow-phoenix.com. Welcome back. Do you have any comments on that? Well, yeah, absolutely. That's my realm of expertise, if you will. The realm of that which is beyond the norm. And we are talking here about the consciousness of each and every human being, their greater truth, their greater reality, their greater being. And, of course, what you're describing are acts of synchronicity, meaningful coincidence, as most people understand that term. But I take it to be something actually beyond that. I take that to be the indicator that in that expansion of our consciousness, those parts that we're, quote, unconscious of, there is still connection with one another. There is connection with a greater spirit, as the Native Americans call it, or divine consciousness, or that which is our awareness, our understanding, our consciousness beyond just a physical state of, of uh, focus. And that when we are in that place, often at an unconscious level, 
we are still emanating our thoughts, our being, and we are still receptive to receive from that greater source information, uh, acts of coincidence or synchronicity, whatever. And I do think that as we expand our conscious understanding of ourselves so that the unconscious shrinks and that which is our more conscious focus expands, then we can partake in acts of synchronicity, can certainly be part of that uh, greater morphogenic field of consciousness that does exist. And it's always wonderful to have experiences where you think of a person and bang, there they are, or they phone you, or some event happens that's in relation to what you're putting out as a need or a thought. And that does, unfortunately, also mean sometimes on a negative side, which is also why it's very crucial, very important to start realizing that our, def our actual beliefs define the realities that we are experiencing. And this is one of the biggest secrets, the powers that be, the elites, do not want you to understand that in your own way of thinking, in the beliefs you hold, that you actually are creating the reality of your experience. And once that starts happening, then you are starting to step out of the control that those in power have. If you really think about it, everything of life is an indoctrination process. And I am being polite because I could easily call it a brainwashing process. And they want you to think in a certain way. They want you to live in a certain way. They want you to be ignorant, dumb, and stupid so that you never, ever ask questions, so you never come to a point of clarity that, hey, maybe that thought I've had and maybe the beliefs I hold are actually shaping my reality. No, they've got to have you as the a sleep victim that never understands and where victimhood is A-OK -okay because then you're in their little box and they can control you. So we go from the whole concept of synchronicity to an expansion that allows us to start to understand that we actually have much greater control than we think we have over our power and that includes the experiences of a nature of that order that are extraordinary and that are well beyond what they are trying to do to us. But hey, they've got 90%, perhaps 80% if you're really optimistic of the populace under their control, under their thumb, asleep, stupid, and dumb. And that's how they want it to be. Well, that's the power of two things uh, coming into light there. The other, the, one being the power of the subconscious and the other being the power mm -hmm. of denial. Um, and yeah. And what I find very uh, amusing, essentially, is people who deny that the subconscious is uh, has has a great effect on them. And so you ask them a simple question: Okay, what goes on in the subconscious mind? I go, I don't know. It's subconscious, exactly. Yeah, but you know, there's an interesting and even what you could call ancient understanding of that uh, philosophy. It was an alchemical, philosophical uh, way of thinking that is called Huna. Huna is still practiced to this day by kahunas. Most people think a kahuna is some surfing dude, some uh, retrobrate who's out there, irresponsible and everything. But a kahuna was in the Polynesian islands, especially in, in uh, Hawaii and around the Hawaiian islands, a very understood technique of what is consciousness? How do we function? And they label it into three parts. There is that which is the low self or the subconscious. There is that which is the middle self, which is our uh, understanding of our identity, who we are. And then they call it the high self or the super consciousness. And the super consciousness is our um, actual conscious being in an expanded level. It's not in a physical form. So it is the guide or the energy of, of focused, conscious thought that exceeds us. And the three parts the kahunas understood needed to be merged and blended into one. And that's why, because they knew how to do this, kahunas could do amazing things. I mean, they could do instant healing. They could walk on lava flows, which we now know as corporation outreach programs where they teach their their big wigs to walk on coals, big, big stuff. 
But that's pure huna. That's pure subconscious saying, okay, I can do this. And then, of course, we are those spiritual aspects that are housed in this physical body. So as the kahunas understood this to a greater degree, they could uh, use that force of conscious awareness to do these miraculous things. They could uh, create chi or ka energy and direct it. They could communicate with the elements and the creatures of Mother Earth. And these are the stories of the ancient kahunas that now we consider as fables and, and fairy tales not possible, but it is still very much possible. Well, and indeed, there, there, there must be people that walk the earth today that are capable of doing such things and, and in fact, continue to do them, yes? Yeah, absolutely. I'm not one of them yet. I'm working towards it, I hope. <laughs> uh, but I think that having that kind of understanding, quite aside from doing those extraordinary types of activities, certainly gives one a greater capacity and now getting back to what we talked about earlier, to deal with those buried beliefs and attitudes, to help the subconscious realize it has a different role than that which is an unconscious driver of our bodies and a creator of our reality. And that's where we have a freedom then, true freedom. Because once we start understanding how we are this three part being, this triunal being, and once we start to integrate this knowledge, we actually step beyond anything that can be done to us. We become the creators of our lives and our, of our reality. And I do believe that humanity is on the verge of rediscovering this. And there are those, as you've just mentioned, who know this and work with it. It is very amazing when what we believe and think turns out to happen, like your example of meeting your mate there uh, as you've parked there and he comes out could also be understood that your subconscious was communicating with his subconscious both from an unconscious level provoking that response on his part to come out just when you arrived so he could help you take your stuff into the building. Mm. There's a South American tribe, I think they came out of the Andes in 1969 after being locked away from the world for 25 generations in accordance with their prophecy. And they came out mm -hmm. um, and started saying, look, this is the prophecy, da-da-da-da. And uh, the upshot of it is uh, there's going to be some kind of uh, uh, electromagnetic disturbance from the sun and it's going to wipe out all your communication devices. But you won't need those communication mm -hmm. devices anymore because that, that subconscious uh, communication of which you were speaking about um, would be uh, now more readily accessible to people. Absolutely. It's All I can say is I believe that is so on, on uh, certain levels, definitely. But I also have to say, good thing we're communicating now before that happens. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, you know, I, there's, there's the uh, problem that I have. I had these um, guys drop around to my house the other day and um, they asked me about this 2012 shift and, and, and what I thought about it. Uh, and mm -hmm. I was thinking, well, what what kind of shift are you talking about? Are you talking about a dimensional shift? And they're like, what's a dimensional shift? And I go, well, you know, this 1D, which is a straight line, 2D, which is a picture, 3D, which is a box, 4D is a box flying yeah. through time, uh, that that kind that kind mm -hmm. of thing. 5D exists a, outside of uh, those those four spectrums. And uh, what some mm -hmm. people believe is that when there's a huge kind of consciousness shift, we're going to um, cease to be three dimensional, uh, shifting yes. through time in the in the three D through 4D, and we're going to transcend both the physical realm and and time and space itself. We become interdimensional yeah. beings, in, in other words, with um, access to the past, present, and future simultaneously. This is the belief of some. Yes. yes, absolutely. And it's my belief very much so. Only I would interject that it's not that we will become these multidimensional beings. I assert and hold that we already are those multidimensional beings. It's just that we are so dumbed down in a physical reality that uh, there are certain laws that bring this reality together. And one of them is that we forget that we are these multidimensional beings. We forget that we far exceed those physical limitations and live accordingly. And thus, I do have to agree, everything in this physical reality, because we have forgotten who we truly are, is in alignment 
with the rules and laws of this reality that govern this reality. And I do think that the events that are coming up, that which is known often as the ascension process, ascending to a higher level of consciousness, is actually just remembering who we are in the first place. And once that you start that process, it is a ride that will take you to the summit, but sometimes like a roller coaster will come up and down and up and down as you're negotiating this reality, as you're breaking free of those restrictions in consciousness itself that bind us to this physical reality. And that is, for me, why this is such an important time. There are many predictions right now of the um, events that will occur, uh, the solar flare concept, the cosmic wave, Mother Earth going into convulsions, earthquakes, disasters, everything. I am not a believer, personally, that the reality I'm about to experience will see the annihilation of Mother Earth. I am a believer that the events may be precipitous to, you know, the mm, changes in consciousness that are needed because the reality that you've held on to so far for so long too has literally been shaken apart or wiped out or whatever but as the Amazonian Indians uh, were, were discussing and saying if at the same time that frees you in your mind in your consciousness to find those links that I was talking about earlier with one another and with the planet and all of her living okay, well, well we can't hear you been kind of cut off rudely by the uh, extremely loud uh, break music <laughs> we'll be right back ladies and gentlemen at the Vinnie Eastwood show with Will Burninghoff from rainbow-phoenix.com final segment coming up welcome back ladies and gentlemen you listen to the Vinnie Eastwood show on American Freedom Radio I was on holiday for about 10 days but now we're back and uh, thank you very much for the uh, the delay in which, uh, and also a special announcement: um, the financial crisis. I'm having one, so if you are capable of donating, please do. Like right now, go to the vinnieeastwoodshow.com. There's a little uh, Vinnie's financial crisis thing up there to uh, donate now. Very, very much appreciate that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, because well, it's Christmas time and uh, ain't nothing going to destroy your Christmas like being broke as a mofo. Um, so if anybody can help me out, uh, yeah, I need your support right now, more than ever. My very special guest is. Will Burninghoff from rainbow-phoenix.com. Now, Rainbow Phoenix. Um, yeah. We wanted to talk about that, but but firstly, you um, kind of were, had a point that you were, um, had to reiterate before before the break came on. Yeah, I was just saying that this whole expansion of our understanding of what and who we really are is that which is commonly understood as the ascension process, ascending in consciousness. And I was stating that while there may be earth events and everything, and a lot of people are just really looking forward because they're going to be survivors. They're going to make sure they've got their stash and nobody's going to take it from them. Well, that's just one level of reality that could be theirs through this process of ascension. Now, it's a negative ascension for those who want to make sure that they continue in a third dimensional reality where they struggle and fight and, and fend off and survive, whereas there are also those levels of reality that have to do more with us moving more into that fifth dimensional level of consciousness you referred to earlier and superseding our three-dimensional form. Now, those who manage that level of ascension, and it doesn't come simply because one says, I'm going to ascend, it's going to happen. There is a degree of work that's involved in self-awareness, working on, on growth and development of mind, heart, and spiritual awareness. But that is a different level of, uh, of the ascension experience. Then there will be those experiences that many hold that will see various levels and degrees of upheaval, but basically things will pass through, pass over, 
and they will carry on in their existence. Now, that is, seems to be contradictory. How can there be these different scenarios? But part of the understanding that I hold through the channeling work, through the bringing forth of cosmic awareness, which is exactly what it indicates, a consciousness of cosmic proportion, cosmic awareness. And in the years of channeling, but especially over the last year or so, what awareness is really revealing is there's not going to be one linear experience that everyone has. There are going to be a multitude of timeline experience, each individual having his own timeline that will take them into the reality that will be formed after the ascension experience is complete and done. I mean, that again is just one of the really... Uh, toenail descriptions here, thumbnail, but it gives you a, a, an understanding of how complex it really is, that which is awaiting us, that which we call the ascension experience. Mm -hmm. So... You know, I've always um, found it very, very uh, uh, dangerous to try and predict future things, unless, of course, it's a planned agenda and they've and they've admitted what they're going to do, and then you can just go, oh, yeah, and and, and it's not, yeah. it's, there's nothing psychic involved there. Um, and yeah. I, I've talked to a number of uh, psychic and uh, and intuitive uh, people, even even. Um, uh, Cliff High from the Webbot program, which kind of started uh, sending yeah. out little things to the web and, and bringing back data packets and coming up with these really strange yeah. predictions. Some true, some uh, some came to fruition, some not. Um, yes. But what's interesting is that uh, these different sources that I've been talking to, they all seem to experience the same thing. There ain't no data mm -hmm. beyond uh, mm -hmm. beyond uh, December twenty first, twenty twelve. It's as if the future's not written yet. And we're writing it as we speak. That's right. And here's the problem. Um, they're dealing with a linear projection forward. And linear means that their projection, their expectations, their beliefs are going to form their future. But if we each as an individual being have our ability to do that, then it's not one linear reality that is going to fit all unless... It's very important, unless you make it fit. And that's what the controllers want. They want as many people with the same belief system and same expectations so that they can manipulate the future. Thus, you know the David Icke's uh, um, problem, uh, uh, get, a, get the people to ask for a solution and then bring the solution in you want. That's what they're doing. They're creating the problems. They're enforcing a mindset. They want people to look towards that, and that, that's the reality that's experienced by the masses. But if you follow this other way of thinking, where we develop and expand our own understanding and awareness, we project our own reality, then we can create a different timeline, a different scenario. It is so anyway. You are doing that, but you're doing it in freedom. You're doing it without the objections of a mass a belief system. You're doing it despite those objections even. And that's when we have the expansion. That's when we can have the other timeline scenarios. I mean, in the end, everyone's creating their timeline. Why not create the one you want? I would say that's the best way to move forward. Yeah, you know, a whole lot of people who come home from work and they complain about how bad their work is and how bad their employee, their uh, the people that they work with are, and how bad their boss is and everything like that. And they're not asking you to help them, and they're not planning to no. help themselves. That's right. Absolutely, they're in their little smug container, and that's how it is, and that's how it is, and nobody else has ever said that it couldn't be that way, shouldn't be that way. Everyone else is in their little box and containers saying the same things, and they support each other. That's reality, you know. Then someone comes along and says, hey, mate, maybe we can do it differently. Maybe your beliefs are what are defining your, uh, your reality. And what is their response? You're freaking crazy. That can't be so. My politicians aren't lying to me. My priest is not molesting my children. I am eating healthy food. You know, it's not irradiated, not sprayed. It's healthy. All of the crapola, if you will, that is believed by a majority of people because that's reality. 
Yes, it's their reality. It's important always to go beyond that box, go beyond the mindset. And that, I think, is the true act of claiming one's freedom in life. And it is perhaps the hardest thing of all for most people to do because they actually have to wake up to do it. Well, Will, I've, I've said for a long time that the crazy people aren't the ones who are waving the signs that say it's the end of the world or, stop, or, or you know, protesting or whatever. They're not the crazy ones. The crazy ones are the, ones, right. are the ones who uh, walk by and they don't even look at the signs. They just, look at, right. they just look at their shoes. They're going from point A to point B and not acknowledging the fact that there's a whole other alphabet out there. Absolutely. They're so asleep. They're so dumbed down that anything that actually get, gets their attention that way is threatening to them. Because in actuality, once you, you start to ask questions, once you open that door, even a crack, then you're going to have to look at something else. And it's too disturbing for most people. They do want to believe the lies and the manipulations and the cons that have been acted upon them because to do otherwise means you might have to do something about it. And as long as you've got your beer and your Monday night football and uh, the comfort zone of the reality you live in that is in coordination with everyone else's comfort zone, then you're normal, then you are okay. The trouble is that isn't okay. That is where the pain is. That is where the the problem of being closed in mind and spirit lies. I'm miserable. I'm unhealthy. I have a slave job. I'm stuck in traffic for hours a day and I spend the rest of my relaxation time feeding myself with brainwashing programming from the mainstream media and, vac and vacuous uh, American Idol programs. And I, and, and I make sure that I, that I smoke copious quantities of weed and, and, drink, and drink more alcohol than, than, than a, a command shiro on the frickin' warpath every, every single weekend. And I go out and I listen to the exact same music and the exact same clubs with the exact same friends that I've been drinking with and talking with since high school who know nothing more than I do and I and I know nothing more than they do so I never actually get myself anywhere in life except into debt and more habitual enslavement I'm normal exactly and I'm free <laughs> I wouldn't call you know <laughs> All right. You know, I can buy things, so my life must be much better than those poor suckers in Africa who don't have anything. <laughs> you know? I don't know about that one, but there you go. Look at it this way, ladies and gentlemen. And Will, thank you for coming on. If the only way you can say that your life is good is by comparison that somebody else's life is worse, then your life ain't that good. <laughs> Not that good at all. And there is a much greater reality out there that each and every human can access. I do think with the times ahead, and especially in the next three weeks, it's going to be an interesting challenge indeed. Yep, and interesting challenges are very happy and fun. Uh, you can go to rainbow-phoenix.com to see more of Will's work. We'll see you next segment with Daniel Holdings. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to our number two of the Vinnie Eastwood show. It's the lighter side of genocide, because in a world so full of chaos and madness, if you lose your sense of humour, you can go friggin' nuts. We're broadcasting live from the fabulously fluoridated capital of Auckland, New Zealand, the Island Chains Nation in the sunny slave South Pacific. It's freaking gorgeous. It's all summery and, sh and Shiite Muslim. Now, we have a guest, but we're not entirely sure if his technical issues have been resolved, so we're just going to go to him now. Uh, Daniel Holdings, are you there? Daniel, can you hear me? Now we've got him on via, via Skype and apparently his uh, microphone's not working so AFR if you can connect him up uh, via that phone number I gave you earlier we'll bring him up that way okay right now uh, announcements I guess uh, New Zealand is having the Agenda 21 uh, uh, globalist domination EU uh, 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 New World Order uh, 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 meetings otherwise known as the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, otherwise known as the TPPA, otherwise known as the GTFO, before I go OTT and BPO'd, mofo. All right, dig this. Back in the day, 
there was this dude called Al Gore. Maybe you've heard of him. And he was pimping this uh, tree, free trade deal uh, called uh, NAFTA and GATT. And said that it would create jobs. And that free trade was good. And it won't destroy the manufacturing base of the United States. And put a whole lot of Americans out of work. And, and decrease their wages. And basically make the economy into a subsistence slave society. Well it did! And so it was su- did such a good job. That now New Zealand and a whole bunch of other countries around the, uh, the rim of the Pacific and I use RIM operatively, wish to now be penetrated by these particular type of free trade deal. And there was a protest on Saturday in New Zealand uh, from midday till 2 p.m. starting at Altair... Well, sorry, 2 p.m. meeting at Altair Square in the centre of the city, marching on Sky City, where they are having this Trans-Pacific Partnership Conference, which is riddled with um, uh, scumbaggery. And uh, lack of transparency as well, considering it's all secret. Now, I believe we've got Daniel on the phone. Daniel, can you hear me? I can hear you, my nocturnal friend. Thank you so much for having me on the line, uh, Vinny. I appreciate it. Hey, all good, brother. Well, let me let me just uh, give a backgrounder on you for the uh, for the audience here. His name's Daniel Holdings, as in you know, Gold Holdings. And uh, if you go to his website, DanielHoldings.com, he's an author of a uh, a book. Uh, in fact, in fact, a number of books that I say. Uh, and uh, the most recent one is about the darkness. And uh, I've got finished uh, reading a uh, few few pages out of it uh, earlier on the show. And it's this really kind of a uh, fantastical kind of a uh, uh, galactic scientific slash. Demons taking over the Earth, 2012, with a with a with a James Bond 007 uh, uh, central <laughs> character pro- protagonist, if I may. And it's pretty choice, actually. You know the uh, the reading the reading style of it, uh, to, with a creative description and giant lightning bolts of plasma and and all of that sort of stuff and volcanoes and and uh, and, and and tsunamis and everything. And this is just the first couple of pages, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> You know, goes for the goes for the gusto. So, why don't you tell us a little bit about what what actually got you into uh, authoring? I mean, this wasn't your first job, was it? No, actually, uh, that, that's actually my second book. My my first book is uh, Three Days in the Belly of the Beast, and it, you know, Vinny, the thing is, I was just listening to a snippet of your last show. Um, you know, what I, your, your guest was talking about people that are asleep and choose to be asleep. For a number of years, I was one of those guys. It wasn't up until about uh, three or four years ago that I myself started to wake up. And, and when I did so, interestingly enough, I read uh, Edward G. Griffin's book, um, uh, Jekyll from, uh, Creature from Jekyll Island. And, and uh, <laughs> I was in the financial industry. When I read that book, it, it presented a number of problems. So eventually... I actually ended up getting out of the financial industry, but, uh, you know, I, I've said this before on the air, and I think it, it begs uh, another uh, time around to describe it. I, 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 I really compare the, the, the financial industry, and I dare say uh, mainstream media, like uh, the, the facade of a movie lot. When you, when you look at the, the facade, or when you look at the front of these supposed buildings, they all look normal. They look... They look substantive. And the problem is if you walk through one of the doors on the facade in this movie lot, you will find nothing behind them or, or supposedly or actually maybe all kinds of other things behind them that you didn't expect. And, and when I went down that rabbit hole with uh, Edward G. Griffin, it, it kind of opened my eyes to a lot of different things. And uh, I began to, to write. And, and that first book, Three Days of the Belly of the Beast, was uh, kind of, uh, the genesis of my writing career, and I, I think it is absolutely pertinent to the discussion that you were having with your guest, uh, your previous guest, and, and the discussion moving forward as we move closer to December 21st, 2012. Now, y- your listeners need to understand these books are fiction. They're designed to be thrillers, and that's the reason for the cool James Bond character and all the crazy stuff happening. But Vinny, you know, it blew my mind because something happened after I wrote that book that, that really caused me a problem. And it was simply this. That, now, your listeners need to understand, I'm a believer, I'm a Christian, 
those books aren't religious based. They're not. They're not. You know, supposed to be Christian, but they are written from my world point of view. And obviously, I believe in Christ, so therefore, there's mention of Christ in there. But there's also a guy in there. He's the world's smartest man. I call him today's Einstein. His name's du- uh, Dr. Bryce Cooper. And Dr. Cooper was an agnostic or an atheist, and, and he's working, he's a physicist, and he's working at the Large Hadron Collider. I know you, that's a subject that you've talked about before on your shows. Uh, so he's working at the Large Hadron Collider, and then uh, equally at the same time, he's drafted to be a consultant on the Heart Project up in Alaska. So what in, ensues is this journey for this really mainstream, straight kind of guy, and he begins to discover all kinds of conspiracy stuff, but in his uh, fictional real world, if you will, he, he finds out that, uh, that what he thought was true wasn't true, and that there's this whole other world that he, he's had to, to, to open his eyes to. So that's the gist of that first book, and obviously, as the darkness falls, the second book is kind of what uh, what launched me into um, what you what you read just recently. <clears throat> now, the predicament that I had for that first book was I, I have a friend, and he wasn't a friend at the time in Oklahoma. His name is Larry Taylor. He's a he's a, a Christian, a godly man, and he he knows a ton of people and. If I named a bunch of people he's no, he knows, you, you'd know them too. Um, so anyway, uh, Larry uh, knows a guy by the name of Barry Rothman. Barry Rothman is a Orthodox Jew. He's not a Christian, but he's an expert on the Torah code. He's American. And uh, Larry, who's a friend of his, got him to run... Three Days in the Belly of the Beast, Daniel Holdings, and some of the storylines from that first book in the Torah Code. And Vinny, it blew my mind, but they actually found that book, my name, and the storylines within the 3,500-year-old Torah Code. So go figure it. I mean, that's, that's kind of what launched this, uh, this writing career of mine, and that's kind of uh, presented the... The situation, well, you know, Dan, what, what are you going to do with it? You have this information, obviously you're onto something, so what are you going to do with it? So that's, that's kind of where that next book came out that you were just talking about uh, as the darkness fell. I don't know if that answers your question. I don't know if it does either. Um, the, the other <laughs> element here that I, that I found very interesting was that the, uh, there were these creatures kind of coming through this uh, uh, parallel portal of hell sort of thing, you know, these giant... Uh, uh, muscly black creatures with blood red glowing eyes and and and, and what have you just basically like uh, you know uh, a cross between uh, a, a sexy devil and a bat out of hell <laughs> yeah I kind, of, kind of like that uh well you know let's talk about that that portal because i i believe that that portal is a real thing now again those books are fiction but i want to go back to that first book uh, because I think if you understand uh, where I've come from, you understand where we're going with that, that next book. Uh, when, when I found out that that first book was in the Torah Code, and I don't know if you're, you or your listeners know much about the Torah Code, but the Torah is the first five books of the Bible. It's uh, the Hebrew Bible, if you will. And uh, it's 3,500 years old. So it's not yesterday's news. It's, uh, it's like ancient news. So at any rate, when... The, when uh, the uh, the Torah code are, are supposed secret codes that are found in, in the Torah that you can only find with computers these days. There's relative, relative uh, relevant news, I should say, uh, in there that, that uh, Barry Hoffman finds on a regular basis. So when he found uh, Three Days in the Belly of Beast in there, it, it really intrigued me, and I began to, to, to really think about this, and lo and behold, I was listening to uh, uh, a gentleman on a talk show, and I know you've had this gentleman on your show before, by the name of Steve Quayle. Now, uh, I, don't, I didn't know Steve Quayle at the time. Uh, Steve uh, was very gracious after several attempts to contact him to, to give me a call, because something he mentioned in, uh, uh, in this talk show was uh, the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, in Geneva, Switzerland, which is buried, you know, 300 feet on the ground, 17 miles 
wide between the, the borders of Switzerland and uh, France that cost $40 billion to put down there, and they're smashing atoms down there. So one of the things that Steve mentioned on this radio show that he was on was that they were conducting an experiment called Operation Falling Star. And again, this is not this is not Daniel Holding's fiction. This is true to life. Well, I did my homework, and when he mentioned this, it, it kind of made the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end because uh, it was in uh, they, they started the the uh, uh, the experiment. They brought the LHC online in September of 2008, I believe it was. And about three or four months later, when they were running an experiment, the system crashed. And what they saw on their computer screens before it crashed was some entity, something of an other world. And when he said that, it, it made me pause, because that is exactly what happened in my first book. And so I was excited, and I called Steve Coyle, and as I said, he finally got back to me. And he said, Dan, you don't understand. He said, not only did that happen in Operation Falling Star, because I told him the plot of the book. He hadn't read it yet. But he said that there was, uh, there's another plot line in the book, uh, in that first book, uh, called Harp. And um, as I said, many of your listeners have heard this, but he said that there is a direct connection between the, the LHC and HARP. And I said, come on, Steve, you're telling me that what I wrote in a fictional book is actually true? And he said, not only is it true, but hold on. And, and he explained to me something very interesting, Vinny, and I think this is where your listeners really need to hear this. He said, if you think of the LHC like a main lock, it's a main portal or the main part of a locking mechanism. If you can open that main lock, then you can open all the associated locks, all the locks that are connected to it. And I said, boy, that's, that's, that's pretty heavy. And he said, well, not only that. He said, you know those chemtrails? And I've heard you guys talk about chemtrails as well. And because you, you do know about chemtrails, you know what they're made of. He said, you know those chemtrails that they spray in the sky, supposedly for geoengineering, that sort of thing? And I said, yeah, yeah, you see them all the time, you hear about them all the time. He said, what they are doing is they are preparing this dimension for the opening of that master lock. And I said, oh, and he said, that's right. And they bounce harp, harp uh, the harp signal off of it in order to, to do that. And, and frankly, Vinny, I was stunned. I said, hold on a second. I said, are you telling me? I said, well, no, actually, what I said to him, I said, I said, Steve, I said, what do you think that, that, that portal is to? What do you think that, that's to? He, he asked me a question here. I said, what do you think it's to? I said, it sounds like the abyss. And he said, that's absolutely right. It's the abyss. I said, Steve? That is crazy. And then he reminded me, Vinny, of the mascot that sits out front of the LHC. Now, I, I don't know if you've had any uh, guests on that have talked specifically about the Large Hadron Collider. And I, I love science. I'm a geek when it comes to this kind of thing. But I'd never really thought about this mascot. I, in fact, I, I passed over it several times and didn't even give it a second thought. But at the very front of their building, there's a mascot. It is the god, the Hindu god, Shiva. Now, Vinny, Shiva is the destroyer of worlds. So let me ask you this. Why in the world would a scientific organization with over 100 co countries participating in this experiment, with over $40 billion invested, have the the god who is a destroyer of worlds as their mascot. Uh, no, other than the fact that science is also a belief structure like a religion? 
<laughs> well, 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 let's address this after the break because I do have, actually have a few uh, uh, conceptions coming to mind as we speak. So, you listen to the Vinnie Eastwood show, ladies and gentlemen. My very special guest is Daniel Holdings from DanielHoldings.com. You can check out his books there and read excerpts of them if it gets your juices flowing in a demonic sense of the word. You can purchase a copy right there on the website, and we'll be right back after the break at TheVinnieEastwoodShow.com. Welcome back. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Vinny Eastwood Show. We're broadcasting live on AmericanFreedomRadio.com. And we have a very special guest, Mr. Daniel Holdings, who's an author of some note. And we're going to be talking about some dark occulted mysticism on the show today, I can assure you of that. We're talking about Shiva, and how it appeared to be the wonderful, wonderful logo of this Hadron Collider which threatened to make a black hole in a, ga- in a dark gateway into another dimension of hell that will swallow up the entire earth and they just thought it was just fabulous because they were trying to find out what God was. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Daniel, welcome <Yeah>. back. <laughs> so is that, about, is that about the size of it? Because he asked me why would they have that uh, 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 symbol of Shiva, which is the destroyer of worlds, being that my guess would be because they're uh, basically Luciferian uh, 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 crazed uh, nutbags who uh, reckon that they can open a dimension to another uh, 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 part of the universe or, or, or whatever. Like, Have you ever seen that movie uh, Event Horizon? Yeah, it's a great movie. Uh, great great movie. movie. One one of the one of the best um, uh, Paul Anderson films uh, ever, and every single film that he's done since then has been pretty crap. But uh, it basically revolves around this ship that has a gravity drive, and what it does essentially is it bends space time. It folds it in half like a piece of paper, so that the ship can travel from one point uh, of uh, the universe to directly to another. But in so doing, uh, it crossed into another dimension. It tore a hole in the universe and it went into a dimension of pure chaos, a.k.a. hell. Um, And is that what these people are are really doing? Are they trying to create a gateway to hell? Well, you know, Vinny, um, I think that with all the things that are happening, you know, so oftentimes when when you talk to somebody, they have their one particular area of interest and... And uh, they'll, they'll talk about chemtrails, or they'll talk about the Large Hadron Collider, or about HARP, or government conspiracies, or the Illuminati. And, and so what I did is I tried to take a step back, and I, I said, okay, how much of these things are right, or are they all right? Are, are they all right, and how are they connected? You're big on connecting the dots. So what I try to do, at least in that second book, is to, to connect the dots in a fun, interesting, thrilling way, and that's how that book came about. With regard to your, your question about dimensions, if you now look, I have, I have a, a statement for your listeners, and, and please don't roll your eyes, listeners. I'm going to show you something, and it's going to sound like I'm being religious. I am not. I'm being scientific. So if you bear with me one sec, we're going to break it down for you. We live, as you know, Vinny, in a 3D world. 3D meaning height, depth, and width. That's what 3D means. So there's three. Now, Einstein postulated there was a fourth uh, uh, dimension that we live in. It's called time. So Einstein postulated that time was the fourth dimension. Okay, that's fine. So we live in a 4D world, right? Well, M-theory in physics says that there are at least ten dimensions, right? Well, let's talk about hell for one second. In the Bible, it's broken. This is the part that's going to sound religious. I don't mean it to. It's just the way it is written in there. In the Bible, there are three sections of hell, if you, were, if you were discussed. The first is hell or Hades. Now, the Bible says that hell and Hades have keys, and that, uh, that there's a time when, when um, Christ goes down after the cross, when he's crucified, and he's res- before he's resurrected, he goes down and he steals the keys to hell, right? He comes back, he's resurrected, and now all of a sudden he can break our physical wall, wall, uh, law. He can walk through walls. He can do all this amazing stuff. So that's the first level of hell. The second level of hell is the abyss. And it says in Revelation, you've heard of John the Revelator, you know, the apocalypse is in there and all that stuff. But it says in Revelation that the abyss is a different place, that it too has keys, that there are some generals locked up in there, and then 
eventually channels you know break free, and that's how all hell breaks breaks loose, if you will. So that's the second level of hell. The third level of hell is called the lake of fire, and at the end of a thousand years, this is where uh, where Jesus Yeshua throws the devil and all his angels in there for all eternity. They can never get out of it. There's no keys to that place. But the point that I want to make is that those are three levels, or if you will, three dimensions. Now, I just said that there are four dimensions that we actually live in, height, depth, width, and time. That's four, plus three dimensions of hell. That's seven. Now, also in the Bible, it says that, Paul says that, I once knew a man who went to the third heaven, who was in the third heaven. So I just, you know, logically thought here, I said, wait a minute. I said, if there's a third heaven, there must be a first heaven and a second heaven, and then a third heaven. So, okay, let's do our math. Seven plus three is ten. Didn't I just say that M-theory says that there's at least ten dimensions? So here's the thing, Vinny. I think that those guys, those scientists at the Large Hadron Collider, know exactly what they're doing. They know that there's other dimensions. And I just broke down, I think there's more than ten, but I just broke down ten of them for you. Now, they don't get to be scientists at the Large Hadron Collider unless they know what's going on. <laughs> so in answer to your question, do I think that they, they, they are uh, actually trying to do this and they know what they're doing? I absolutely think so. Well, uh, you know the old saying that truth, truth is stranger than fiction? It's because <laughs> fiction has to make sense. The truth, the truth very rarely does. <laughs> you know, the, the, the tagline to that new book, and, and this is uh, very important, it, it, the tagline is, uh, for the darkness falls, uh, as the darkness falls, is uh, nothing is as it seems. I'm going to say that again. Nothing is as it seems. And the reason that I put that tagline on that new book, and what that new book does, is it goes through a litany of all the things, many of them you've talked about on your show, all the things that are befalling the earth right now, all at the same time. Remember I said that, you know, most of the time people have their own pet pee, they have their own area of interest, and they focus on that. So when I tried, when I wrote the book, I tried to take a step back and go, okay, how do all these things connect? And what I, what I, what I came up with was, was, in fact, that they do connect, Vinny, and nothing is as it seems. You, you, you are always, and so, ap, so aptly so, you're always talking about how, you know, they, uh, they, they try to dumb us down with the media, and they try to show us things to make us sleep, to keep us asleep. But, but what I found is, if you really took a hard look, a macro picture, if you will, at all the things that are befalling the earth, it'll scare the heck out of you. But you have to understand, more than being scared, you have to understand that there is a spiritual element here. And because if all we look at sci is science, and if all we look at is uh, uh, religious things, or if all we look at is political things, or if all we look, we're not going to get it. There's a motivation behind what is going on, not only in, in, at the LHC, but, and not only at heart, but uh, with, with many things that are going on in the world. And if I can just give this away in the new book, um, I, I'm sure I have not heard you talk about this, but have you heard of the Georgia Guidestones before? Uh, yes, yes, I have. Eight languages, or, uh, eight modern and eight ancient languages, saying that they want to reduce the population to 500 million and perpetual balance with nature, a global language, global courts. Uh, essentially, it's the uh, blueprint for a new world order. That's exactly what it is. Now, you know, the, the, thing about, the thing about the Illuminati or the New World Order is they're pretty bold. What they like to do is to tell us, because they think we're dumb and ignorant, and help us for that matter, they like to tell us exactly what they are going to do, and then they just go about and, and do it. They have, a, they have a plan, they have a timeline, and, and as we, we are getting closer to the culmination of that timeline, you know, what they've done is, in, in this instance, they put some big old rocks, big old granite pieces, in the middle of nowhere in Georgia, and the first commandment, you're absolutely right, says to reduce the, the population to 500 million. Well, folks, that means that they want to kill off 
6.5 billion people. I'm going to say that again. They want to kill off 6.5 billion people. Now, that's crazy, Vinny, but they don't make sense many times. <laughs> they, they're, uh, they are obsessed with power. They are obsessed with having uh, everything uh, for themselves. And, and as a consequence, they are willing to destroy a good part of the world to do it. And that was kind of the basis or the crux of that second book as the darkness falls. And, and what, uh, what the hero does, Bryce finds himself uh, with a download of all this information. And that, I, I haven't even started talking about uh, earth changes right now. I know you guys understand, uh, your audience understands about earth changes. Benny, just yesterday I read that the 72nd volcano went off and is active now. 72 volcanoes active on the earth right now. That's crazy. That's never happened in modern times. You know, I read someplace else that uh, within a period of 90 days, there were seven, over seven earthquakes. So mega, uh, uh, seven on the Richter scale, over seven earthquakes in 90 days. That's crazy. So, so what is really going on right now? See, this is what I mean. If we, if we don't take a step back and look at things through spiritual eyes, then, then we're going to miss it. We think it's all about earth changes, or we think it's about the Illuminati, or we think it's about whatever. But history is racing toward a culmination. And it's just not me saying that. You see, here's the crazy thing. There, and you know this. There, there, are, there are cultures all over the world, ancient cultures, that have said this, this very same thing. And I actually got a, a list from L.A. Marzulli. Uh, off of one of his watchers' videos, and, and uh, I'm just going to uh, read a couple of them here. The Hopi predicted that a 25-year purification followed by the end of the fourth world and beginning of the fifth happened in 2012. The Mayans uh, call... Uh, whoa, 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 hold on a second. Could we say that the end of the fourth world means the end of the fourth dimension and the entrance into the fifth world, i.e. the fifth dimension, which transcends both space and time? Uh, well, I don't know if they were that advanced, but I'm telling you, they certainly saw a uh, a shift in what was considered normal. Well, the Mayans, uh, Mayans had, had really well, ad advanced tech, you know, they, they, they built all those um, giant frickin' pyramids and... Uh, and what was the other thing? Um, was it Pakal Katan? I think one of the one of their deities, and uh, in his sarcophagus or, or whatever, he had breathing. He, there was a carving of him on the top of it, and he had breathing apparatus, and he had his. Um, he was basically. It looked like he was riding a jet bike, really, like off Star Wars. A breathing apparatus yeah, plugs yeah. up, plugs up his nose, his hands on the throttle, feet on on pedals, and stuff like that. Sort of like a, a exhaust kind of coming out the rear of the of the vehicle. It was quite extraordinary. They had yeah, um, these was, these little golden statuettes of of uh, jet planes and and, um, and and submarines and tanks and helicopters and stuff, didn't they? Just like the Egyptians did. That's right. That's right. And in, in fact, some of that stuff are in those books. But you know, there I, I have a list of about twelve, eleven, twelve different cultures: the Zulus, the Mayans, the Aztecs. I, I could go on and on and on. They're all saying that twenty twelve is is the time. Now, why is that? And you know what this. I'm just going to make a statement. Now, this is a, a, a faith-based statement. But if you don't know Jesus, you'd be scared to death right now because it is crazy. Twenty December 21st, 2012 is only three weeks away, and it, it promises to be a very bumpy time. I don't think it's the end myself. I, I think we're going to wake up on December 22nd, and we're still going to be around. And But let me tell you something. The world has changed as we know it. And thus, that is how I came up with uh, the title for that second book, As the Darkness Falls. Because, Vinny, what I see happening in the world is this significant darkness, a, a darkness like we've never seen before falling upon the world. And, you know, you can say that the Illuminati is bringing it. You can say that, you know, society is falling apart, but... I think what we are seeing is, at least from a societal aspect, things happening or people doing things that they would never do 
you know, 40, 50, 60 years ago. Things, things are getting downright crazy, and there seems to be this uh, oppression or this darkness. And it, 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 it started, I think, probably a couple of years ago, but I think we're going to see uh, as we get closer to the 21st, you're going to feel this oppression, you're going to feel this darkness, this, this evilness, if you will, even gather more momentum. And uh, so that, that, that's kind of the way that I see things happening. I don't mean to, to sound like a, a, a real downer for your, your listeners, because at the end of this show I want to give them some hope, but the point is that this is not normal anymore. <laughs> By any stretch of the imagination, you know, uh, things have, have shifted, they've changed drastically, and that there are, there are ancient cultures uh, throughout history that have said, this very same thing, and they're all looking to the end of December uh, 2012. Isn't that amazing? Well, I don't know, and I see a lot of uh, different uh, connections here as well, like uh, smart meters, for example. They're rolling those out, and uh, the uh, global, like both in New Zealand and, and in Canada, as far as people have uh, given me direct testimony, but I assume it's the same for the rest, implementation for global smart meters is December 21st, 2012, or at least that's their plan, um, but because there's a lot of people resisting and putting smart meter blockers on, they're not com- going to quite accomplish that objective. Uh, incidentally, I also saw in another uh, documentary that the Pentagon had a global surveillance um, network system uh, going online uh, on December 21st, 2012 as well, so a lot of combinations. We'll be right back. Experience you listen to the Vinnie Eastwood Show, uh, broadcasting live from New Zealand in English. And uh, we got listeners from all around the world, so I hope I hope you and I you all kind of feel together in a um, in a, in, a, in a clandestine uh, cabal sort of way. My very special guest is Daniel Holdings from DanielHoldings.com, author of a couple of books there, and uh, you can go and check those out, and the, you can read brief snippets of it as I have uh, before you make your purchase if you wish to. And and you know what is interesting um, about fiction. Is that my? Uh, uh, you know the old saying that a lot of many truths are said in jest. Well, many truths are, se- are said in fiction as well. That it, essentially, people wouldn't be able to process it and get it unless it was delivered to them in a fictional context. That's what I find interesting. I think I think that's absolutely right, and that was part of the motivation for writing those books. Is that there were a lot of things that I had learned when I told you I just woke up about three and a half, four years ago. There were a lot of things that I'd learned. They were so voluminous that, you know, to sit down and talk with somebody, you'd make their eyes glass over and their head spin. So what what I really want to do is to put it in a a concise, interesting, exciting format that they could actually glean some interesting and helpful information, and thus those you know those books that that uh, came across. <clears throat> That's how I, I ended up doing that. Excuse me. You know, one of the things that. Uh, Talking about things that are fiction and actually uh, true, uh, I, I, I wanted to mention this to you, and I'm sure you've actually heard this as well. You know, back on May 8, 2012, because we're talking about 2012, we're talking about uh, those things that are befalling the earth, but, you know, there was a national security advisor to Obama. Uh, his name was Thomas Donilon. Thomas Donilon asked for a rushed meeting with President Putin out of Russia. And at this meeting, he was talking about this, the souring relationships between Russia and America. And, and uh, you know, they were talking about uh, trade sanctions. They were talking about potential conflicts. They were talking about all this stuff. And, and uh, Putin got upset at him, and, and he said something like, well, you know, Obama hasn't done anything since he's been in there, and he's not being very cooperative. At the end of the meeting, this, is, this blew me away. This is, this is one of the, the advisors to the head of the United States of America. This, this Donilon said, uh, it, here's a quote, as the, the, the meeting neared its end, the report states that Donilon became decidedly dejected and voiced his concern to Putin uh, about uh, everything that was going on. And then he cryptically stated, now here's a quote, what's the difference in any of this anyway? N- Nostradamus is the one in charge. None of us even have a world to live in before the year's out. Now, Vinny, what the heck is that? <laughs> this, is, this is a guy that advises the head of state, and they think Nostradamus is in charge. I, 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 for the life of me, this is an instance where fiction 
is stranger than life. I, I just don't understand. Well, it just, uh, I don't know. It just sounds like those people are a bunch of Nostra dumbasses. Well, that, that could very well be, but y- you know what? Um, I think many times... Well, hold on a second. Here's, an, here's another thing. Hasn't there been a lot of predictions of the end of the world thus far, and, and thus far the world hasn't ended? And I get a question in from my, my good friend uh, Karen Tostado, um, and he says, on December 21st, 2012, if nothing huge changes or anything like that, what will you then think about it? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I thought so. You know, Karen, I, I've already said that I think we'll be here December 22nd. I don't think... December twenty first is the end of the world. Well, she, she's she's is, having a uh, a roundtable discussion on the uh, on the twenty first. Uh, I'm going to be joining her there, but because I'm broadcasting live from the future, it'll actually be the twenty second uh, for me. So I'll <laughs> I'll be able to give them a live report from the end from the other end of the world at the end of the world. <laughs> um, you know, uh, and this is the thing. I, I don't think it's the end of the world. I, I've already said that. I, what I do think is that things have changed. Uh, things have changed. They are changing, and that is marking uh, a really, really significant time in the Earth's history. And uh, we are going to see. You know, we see really crazy things going on now. And uh, you know, all you have to do is, is look at alternative media to see some of it. Can I um, can I interject something here? You know, the sure. meaning meaning of the word apocalypse is the uh, the revealing of great truth or something to that effect, right? Well, I was just thinking about this. We currently live in a world of great lies and deception. So it is the end of the liars and deceivers. It's their end, not ours. One, one could only hope, <laughs> and I hope so. Um, but I fear that uh, it's just more of the same, if not, if not worse. Well, you I, know, I, think, I, think, I think U.S. elections have taught us all that. Well, you know, if you just look, you know, I don't really like talking about politics because it drives me crazy. I mean, me too. <laughs> That's the reason I had to take ten days off, bro. Is that was right after the elections? It was just just mind exploding with that stuff. In fact, let's change the subject quickly. <laughs> well, you know, if you you sit there and you 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 say, okay, I'm a Republican or I'm a Democrat. Okay, so you believe the lies of the Republican, or you believe the lies of the Democrat. Which choose which one? They're both lies. <laughs> Doesn't really matter. You know, when you look at when you look at what happened in the the U.S. elections, I, for one, I don't I don't believe he won that election at all. And uh, <laughs> the reason I say that is because uh, you know there's no way that he could have got 108 percent in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. There's no way he could get that many votes there, or Ohio for that matter. It just it didn't make sense. But my point is that they needed that guy in there. And and Romney, this is the difference. Romney knew they needed that guy in there. Romney knew he was never supposed to win there. He was just he was just the guy that was going up against him. This is this is the set thing. So, you know, one can only hope that as we near uh, the end of December of 2012, we're going to see some good changes. But I, I, I fear what they are really doing is lining up for uh, their end game. Because, you know, I just can't, I can't get out of my mind the, uh, the Georgia Guidestones. They have an agenda. You were talking about, you know, uh, smart meters before we went to break. You know, that's part of the totalitarian society that we are now moving into. Uh, I heard this, this crazy uh, story. I read this crazy story where these, uh, one of these towns in the Midwest, I think it might have been on the East Coast, where they're, they're installing microphones and they're installing cameras on the street so that they can eavesdrop on conversations and see everybody, what they're doing. You now, know, that's not... This reminds me of a, a, a couple of things. Uh, firstly, the uh, 21st is on a Friday, and it'll be the last day of banking for the year. And incidentally, the uh, the Monday after that uh, is the 100-year anniversary of the Federal Reserve Act, which like, mo- which, like most draconian legislation that has huge effects and of great importance, is passed over Christmas time when nobody's there! <laughs> I, I didn't even talk about that. Because, you know, I, I, economics... Physical, uh, fiscal responsibility, I, I kind of have an eye for that sort of thing. But let's talk about that for just a second. Now, if you don't believe that there's a, a meteor coming, and I don't think so, but if, if you don't believe that, uh, you know, the, the uh, and I can't say this word, but the Mayan temple, the portal at the Mayan temple that, 
these uh, Mayan priests are trying to open up in Cuatacato, I think is the name of it, doesn't let out the serpent god, and he doesn't consume everybody in his bed. All you got to do is to look at the, the fiscal cliff, and I'm not talking about the fiscal cliff that the mainstream media are talking about. I'm talking about what you're just talking about, because the charter on December 21st is up. And Vinny, do you know that that charter, that it takes the approval of the president to renew that charter? Because it's only 100 years, it has to be renewed, right? Well, okay, so it's, so it's, 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 it's go along with whoa, 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 whoa. So it's under the approval of Barack Obama, who gave more money to the bankers in his first year of office than the entirety of U.S. presidents ever gave to the bankers in the entirety of frickin' history. That's right. That's I, right. Wonder, that's I wonder which way he's going to vote. Yes, yeah, so that's a pretty easy guess. He'll probably go with it, I would think. But then, okay, it has to be approved by a supermajority of Congress. A supermajority of Congress. That's 60, 65, 60%, I think, is what it is. Okay, those guys can't agree on anything. I mean, can you see the, apart the from, Republicans in apart the, from the state? Okay, you, Apart from the Patriot Act. <laughs> well, yeah, apart from the Patriot Act. But they were all scared to death. They were forced into that. That's why they did that, I guess. Yeah. Really well, they all say. agree that they don't want to read legislation before they pass it. I think that's what they really fundamentally agree upon. Okay, so, so as far as them approving that, that's a maybe. Okay, that's a maybe. They might go along with it, right? But the other thing that it takes is it takes a majority. No, I take that back. It takes 100%, 100% of all 50 states to ratify it. Now, Vinny, I don't know if you know much about Arizona or Texas, but those guys are rebels. Oh, yeah. <laughs> They're never going to approve it. They want us to see from the union as it is. Yeah. It, 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 so it's not going to get approved. What does that mean exactly? I don't know. But well, I from, think they might just um, throw some bait and switch type, type legislation in there. Like they'll they'll call it something else, and then uh, when people will vote on that something else, thinking that it's actually different, they'll then switch it with the uh, the existing legislation that they wanted to pass in the first place. So people will vote on it without knowing that they're voting on it, and then when it gets passed, and then they go, "Oh well, I'm sorry, it's passed now. It'll be impossible to repeal." Uh, your slaves. Well, that, that, that could be, and it wouldn't be beneath them to do that. But the other thing that I want to draw your attention to is FDIC insurance here in America. FDIC insurance is what governs deposits. That runs out on the 31st. If that goes away, there will be a bank run, and the banks will collapse. The economy will collapse. So I think they're playing for the end game, and it's not just, you know, we're not in Kansas anymore. This is way different than normal. Yeah. I, I, I tend to agree, you know, if, if anybody takes a real critical analysis across a multi-spectrum of different disciplines and things all over the world, everybody would know that we're in a huge state of flux right now, and the future's not set. Our fate is what we make for ourselves. So if you want to have a good future, <laughs> try building one. Don't sit around and, wa and wait for one to be built for you, because I can assure you the future that will be built for you is a prison from which you will never be able to escape. Daniel Holdings from DanielHoldings.com. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening, and please donate, please donate at TheVinnieEastwoodShow.com. We'll see you again sometime. No matter where you live, globalism affects you. Did you know that The Vinnie Eastwood Show has more subscribers than New Zealand Herald TV and is New Zealand's most popular YouTube news channel where warm-hearted humour and a list of awesome guests talk about crucial issues which the mainstream media ignore? A show where you, the listener, can phone up with questions, comments and suggestions of guests. Vinny is building a hub to connect truthers with raw information they need to become active. He can help you gain further skills such as website building, producing audio and video and creating revenue streams in your own multimedia environment. Because Vinny supports such a wide range of people in the truth movement, he is not government or corporate backed and relies entirely on your donations. Give now! Give generously or subscribe for $10 a month for access to ad-free video archives. Just visit the VinnieEastwoodShow.com and click donate. If you take an active interest in maintaining the optimum health and well-being of yourself and your family, the New Zealand Journal of Natural Medicine is the magazine you've been waiting for. Having taken Australia and New Zealand by storm, the New Zealand Journal of Natural Medicine is now available in the UK and Europe. Visit www.nznaturalmed.co.uk 
or call 01626 337 531 to order your copy now. Do you realize every day we are being put under constant stress from wireless radiation? What's worse is that you don't even know that it's happening. It puts as much stress on our body as if we had a constant viral infection, draining our energy and sapping our strength, or just making us irritable and fatigued. These wireless fields are being emitted from computers, microwaves, mobile phones, power lines, and any electrical appliance. Now there is a solution. A group of research engineers in New Zealand have come up with an active shielding device that shields you from wireless radiation at a cellular level. Blue Shield comes in three models, a household, portable, and USB that plugs into any computer. The great thing about Blue Shield is it is very affordable and guaranteed to last. A one-off purchase will see you being protected for years to come. Visit AmericanFreedomRadio.com and click on the Blue Shield banner. Blue Shield, brought to you by the VinnieEastwoodShow.com. of the of the heart because it's often very emotionally related that it uh, layers up again and we think that's normal we assume that we have to live at such high levels of stress in fact we're taught you have to have stress because stress is what gets you through well stress is a motivator it helps indeed in helping people deal with situations but I think there's another way, and this is part of my shamanic tra training, that taught you can have something called relaxed focus. In other words, you do not have to be on that edge of rawness all the time. You can actually deal with life in that relaxed way where the focus is so complete and thorough that you can sail through the situation without losing control. Because under stress, often we also lose control and are incapable of dealing with any given situation because of the stress. So it's one of those things I feel that there has to be a balancing here of how much stress is good and how much is detrimental and negative. I would say that the short-term stress, which is like, oh, I've got to get this done now, I've got to get this done now, and then you get it done, and then whoosh, that's fine because that's a, that's a, <laughs> that's a time-sensitive uh, short window. It's the yeah. constant suffering, stressfulness, uh, nervousness, uh, living one day to the next that really pisses people off. And if you really look at our lives and how we've been shepherded into a type of lifestyle when, where long-term stress is debilitating and accumulative, you can see why illness begins to take its toll. Of course, on the other side of the coin, those who are in charge of the medical industry love that because it just gives them more business. So no problem there yeah. for them. <laughs> <laughs> Well, problem for us equals revenue source for them. That's that's how I've um, kind of become to understand okay. the uh, the medical industry, um, essentially, uh, essentially because it wouldn't have a business if people weren't sick. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe that it might be acutely aware of this. It may be at some level of the medical establishment that illness mm -hmm. equals profit. Um, and so mm -hmm. they purposely give people pills and vaccines and uh, other uh, radio radioactive therapies and, and, and what have you in order to make them sick so that they can keep treating them for the illnesses that they propagated in the first place. Absolutely. You've got that correct. And isn't it a wonderful scam that they've got going that they've convinced the audience the that your mind and body can go through um, in mm -hmm. that it there's an old saying, it's uh, those whose reach exceeds their grasp are the only ones who find out how far they can truly reach. Um, mm. and, and I relay this to uh, trauma as well. Those who have suffered the most are the only ones who can find out how much they can truly survive. You know, you have a very, very valid point there. Because trauma, when it releases or when you have recognition, when you understand the lessons that are contained within a traumatic experience can be very liberating. But equally, it can be very damaging if you can't release that negative experience and the negative effects of that experience. 
And that's why I think it is important to release the trauma so that you can actually access the lessons and uh, the experience that lie beyond it. It is a little bit, I'd say, like you know, going into a cauldron and being refined from the dross into the purity of gold or the purity of spirit or consciousness. If I may, it sounds um, similar to chiropractic where you've got all these um, pressures and traumas uh, in your life that actually have a physical effect on you. You get um, manifestations in your, in your spine and, your, and, your, and discs slipping and, th- and things like that. Um, and really, Absolutely. really highly skilled chiropractors can figure out what that past trauma was in your life and then uh, give you an adjustment and it puts you, and it puts you back right and lets it go. That, that's a good analogy right in itself. I like the uh, analogy of colonics, where many layers have been impacted in the intestinal tract. And, you know, as those layers impact there, the ability to absorb or to function well is greatly reduced. And colonics, of all things, would take those layers away. So I guess I perform a kind of colonic uh, practice there of removing the layers that impede one's uh, clarity and wisdom and knowledge and like a chiropractic procedure once you relieve that pain or those layers then you come to the essence then you come to the actual base of one's personality and you can function so much better as a result Mm. that's how i see it at least (laughs) well well, i I think of this um we're, we're talking about essentially medical treatment right or or well not in the allopathic sense of the word or the um but but we're talking about deeper things and and if you have a look at what causes illness uh 90 percent stress absolutely stress and a build-up of that energy of the mind you were living in canada or or australia Uh but now we know yeah, my wife wouldn't have appreciated my living in us in Canada and all that. I think so. I moved here about four months ago. All oh, right. So, How have you been enjoying yeah. it? Is uh, Agenda Twenty One coughing up some nice sparkling uh, 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 chem- chemtrail uh, lovingness for you? Well, actually, I'm very fortunate to be living in a section of Australia in Western Australia, actually, where we just aren't having a lot of chemtrails. I'm happy to say, so no problem there. Yeah, I've heard that Western Australia is a kind of like in a, in a league of its own. Um, uh, the the city Perth, I think, is the most isolated city in the world, and it, it's got its own, it's got its own uh, uh, government in Western Australia and all of that kind of thing. It's vastly different from the rest of the country and indeed the rest of the world. Yeah, that's for sure. I was in Perth a few weeks ago, and I must admit they have no end of chemtrails and harp activity happening there. I've never seen any clouds like that in my life so it was quite amazing and then come back here to the small town of Denmark Western Australia it was just a total relief to come back to sanity again and the clear clear skies you, so it was great oh yeah well I, I, I suppose one time when you when you when you think about chemtrail activity I've, I've been um, receiving emails and messages from so many people that are living in uh, rural areas where you, you wouldn't expect it and they see these giant ones come come right across every every now and again yeah quite honestly I think they just forgot about Denmark and d- deemed it as not significant enough here in uh, this part of Western Australia to even worry about chemtrails is it much of a food growing, a uni- is it much of a food growing area very rural yes a lot of uh, organic farming happening here and uh, dairy cattle and things like that so i don't mind that at all good good diet i've actually lost weight since i've come here it's either that or my wife is starving me to death one or the other <laughs> you know something my producer noticed when he moved to uh, new zealand from the united states or the uh, the different high qu- higher quality food that we've got here um, his entire family, like, uh, just just shed the pounds. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. In any video links that I I do back home to my family and friends in Canada, they all remark on how much weight I've lost, and uh, that's the truth of it. So I'm not not dissatisfied with that at all. Okay, well, for those who are, who are unfamiliar, you you you're a um, what's known a, a shaman, a, a practicing shaman. Can I ask you? What exactly is a practicing shaman in the Agenda 21st century? 
Well, that's a, a very interesting question in its. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Vinnie Eastwood Show and broadcasting live on AmericanFreedomRadio.com. He's back, back in black, ladies and gentlemen, like frickin' Akadaka. It's Vinnie Eastwood, ladies and gentlemen. We've been on uh, holiday for about 10 days. And you know what was something very interesting about being on holiday from conspiracy theories and, and uh, people coming to talk to you about uh, helping them out and, and exposing scumbaggery and, do, and doing videos and all of that kind of stuff because you're pretty much the only person who does that sort of thing in this country? There's no such thing as a holiday. I, I was interrupted on average six times per day. For for uh, each of those days of my holiday, by people needing me to do something for them, and the vast majority of which I did help, including uh, Ian R. Crane, who came over here from the UK to deliver four lectures, and those lectures are now published up on uh, my YouTube channel. You can click on the eugenics button, uh, the YouTube eugenics button, on the Show dot com if you want to go see. Uh, the four 90 minute and 720 HD lectures of his that I had published and uploading within 24 hours of him delivering those speeches. There is also, um, what was his name? Uh, John Ansell, who is a uh, guy from, I think, the ACT Party or whatever, leading this uh, new party discovery called the uh, the Colorblind Party, attempting to uh, rid away with some of the uh, racial divides and, and what have you with New Zealand and uh, what he calls uh, Griever Māori and the, uh, the industry that has flocked abound around uh, treaty claims. Uploaded that. So even on my day off... Uh, even on my week off, ladies and gentlemen, I still actually wind up producing more content than most people do when they're doing 40 hours a week of this kind of game. All right? <laughs> Seriously. I uh, <laughs> I was quite surprised at, at how much I did. So, today, we have a very special guest, uh, and his name is is Will Burlinghoff. His website is rainbow-phoenix.com. That's www.rainbow- uh, like a little uh, dash in the middle thingy there. Phoenix.com. Will, welcome to the program. He's joining us from Canada, I believe. No, actually, Vinny, I'm joining you from Australia. A Canadian who's now living in Australia as it happens. Well, that's funny because so. we had a conversation yesterday and there was sort of a bit of a, a confusion because you, you, you're married to an Australian and I thought... Self. I did study shamanism through a group in the United States uh, called the Deer Tribe and that allowed me to find that connection with Mother Earth or the Earth uh, Logos, Gaia. And I think that simply gives you an impression or an understanding of the significance of the consciousness of the planet itself. Now, I wouldn't describe myself entirely as a shamanic practitioner, but I do have my shamanic background, and uh, I would say that my real focus is more the spiritual uh, information that I have access through through my channeling ability. But that has a lot to do with the shamanic approach too. So that's how I see myself as a practicing shaman of a spiritual nature. So let me get this straight. You're sort of a, an information conduit plus channeling equals a uh, spiritual guide? Yeah, that would be a very good way of, of saying it. I do have a background in psychology from way back. Don't ask me how long ago I graduated. But after my graduation and, you know, um, emerging out of the web of uh, the manipulated consciousness, I started my own personal journey that many years ago, 30 plus years ago, and along the way I've just acquired the ability to be able to be this open conduit for a, a living force of consciousness that calls itself cosmic awareness. And that is the area that I, I specialize in, but I have been able to do things like the tarot card readings and uh, counseling work, regression work, all of that is all part of the umbrella that I, I sit under. Well, it says on your profile that you um, are good at getting people through trauma and, and, and what have you. How, how exactly would you go about that? Well, 
my personal approach to that would be to help them get into the level of the trauma, that being through, if I'm doing a counseling session, uh, through taking them through regression therapy, taking them into a deeper level of their consciousness. I work at uh, what I call a multidimensional level, so my acceptance of the fact that we have a consciousness that far exceeds our physical awareness and understanding is uh, that which helps me the most in helping them get to a traumatic situation in their lives. And quite honestly, what I would help them do is re-script the trauma and release it from their consciousness, from their body, from, from their lives. And that's how that part works. It's actually a little more detailed, but I think that's the thumbnail sketch. Well, trauma for me is actually one of the uh, most beneficial processes 